Jayan was very fond of the initiatives of people with disabilities in ITC hotels, and he always mentioned it. So this is a tribute for him and for all the others in the audience. And uh, now the screen is visible, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Yes. So uh, way back in 1988, uh, I was not aware of the triple bottom line when I was uh, in that remote location. And uh, the triple bottom line uh, terminology was coined by a gentleman called John Elkington in 1994 in UK. And uh, I was posted in Kalapani. As you can see, the arrow pointing. This is also called Port Blair. It has innumerable challenges out there. I'll not go into the details of that. But there are very few places in the world which can be conferred with bragging rights. And I think Andaman Nicobar Island has this unique privilege because of its gin clear water, virgin forest, and exotic uh, flora and fauna. And these are some of the view of the hotel that I was running those days. And this is the view from the uh, lobby of the hotel. It's a fantastic view. and. In different seasons, you see different colors of the sky and the sun. And uh, in case you get an opportunity, please go and visit Port Blair. Uh, innovation was a nebulous subject for me those days. I didn't know the nuances of innovation, that to innovate, you have to take risk. And a lot of us don't take risk in this country because uh, we are laughed at. If you fail, then innovation has also got a feature of breaking the uh, rules of the game. So if you have been asked to do certain things in a particular way, I forgot those rules and started my own new rules in the small island. And then you demonstrate that what you're doing has relevance, not only in that particular place, but it can be replaced or transplanted in some other place. Then only the true value of innovation is appreciated. And offer latent service design. You know, sometimes you come out with new ideas or new products which a customer is not asking. And when he's given, then he or she appreciates it. For example, none of us asked for internet in the 90s, but when we got it, we are now glued to it. So since I'm talking about the social dimension of triple bottom line, uh, I was very embarrassed in, uh, I think, 1989, when one of the uh, gentlemen who came to me seeking my help for uh, financial help for his orphanage and uh, our hotel's revenues were very, very meager. So I didn't give him a yes or no answer, but I caught hold of my engineer and said, let's go and visit this orphanage. So we went there to see how they were performing. And uh, then I requested my uh, finance guy to give this orphanage you know, 150 rupees worth of uh, stationery, pencils, et cetera, et cetera. And that was put on autopilot. But, the, but I was not feeling very nice giving this 150 rupees, but then, that amount that we paid was commensurate to our earnings. So you can imagine how low our occupancy and how low our earnings were. But then I told my engineer, Thomas, why don't you send your carpenters, uh, carpenters, uh, plumbers, and electricians to upgrade the orphanage? And we did that. So one of the lessons which I would like to share with the students is that sometimes you may not have money, but the intent is important. And there are three things which everybody can have. You may not have all the three things, but you can remember the three T's, that is time, talent, and treasury. So we gave all three to this uh, orphanage and helped them to upgrade it. So based on this learning, when I came to mainland, we introduced one orphan boy in one of our southern region hotels. And we were a little worried that, you know, he might create trouble for us, but that was uh, unfounded uh, fear. This guy, he was put in the bakery. He was so hungry for knowledge. Instead of working for eight hours, he'd work for 12 hours. And we told him that he can work for six months and, and then he can look for a job anywhere. Or if we have a, a, a job available in that hotel, he can get a job. Because he was so hungry for knowledge and he worked extra, after three months, he disappeared. He got a better job. And that gives the confidence that we need to do this in many locations. But even then, after doing it in many locations, how many people we had? About 50, 60, 100. The numbers didn't excite me. So I used to interact with the Ministry of Tourism. I said, look, why don't you make a guideline that all large hotels, depending on the number of rooms that they have, they need to do this program. And you'll be happy to know they started a program called Hunur Se Rozgar. For those of you who don't know Hindi, uh, skills from 
skilling, uh, jobs from skilling. And when I was back in Port Blair, uh, our hotel did not have generators. So when the power went off, we used to light a candle and that used to worry me because the candle could be a source of fire and our hotel was made out of wood. So I used to dream about solar and wind, but both were a dream only because those days in 88, the cost of solar was very expensive and wind technologies were also very expensive. So nothing happened. So the flirting with renewable energy started in 1988. And then in 1998, uh, I had the opportunity of working in a huge project. We had 3000 laborers and I used to take care of the environment, health and safety of the workers in order to add value to the uh, migrant laborers. We taught them how to make this low cost solar cooker. You can make it in your own home at a cost of 45 rupees. But if you don't want to spend 45 rupees, pick up some cardboard which comes to your house, especially in the e-commerce day, a lot of cardboard comes home and aluminum foil, stick it and make it. In case you want the details of this, I can share it with the organizers and they will share the details of this with you. Simultaneously, we started teaching this to the kids also. Uh, because if kids learn renewable energy, energy technologies at a younger age, then they'll adopt it on a grander scale later on. So simultaneously, uh, I installed one solar concentrator. This generates a temperature of 150 degrees centigrade. And this Dava fellow, he started using this for boiling his potatoes and he reduced his gas cost and coal cost. The point was to put these ideas in the public domain so that scaling up happens in millions of dhabas across the country. Uh, I must say I've successfully failed in uh, scaling this up because of multiple reasons. A, the knowledge of these technologies is still very uh, confined to rarefied atmosphere. B, a level playing field has to be created like it has been done for solar where there are a lot of incentives given there. And in our country, in the uh, MSME and the SME sector, the heating needs are in the range of 150 to 180 degrees centigrade. And this concentrator has capabilities of generating heat up to 1300 or 1400 degrees centigrade. I had the opportunity of going to Baroda way back in 97, where my friend Deepak Gardia uh, demonstrated one large solar concentrator. Uh, it was supposed to be for a crematorium and he demonstrated, he put a log of wood at a particular point and then he focused the sun's energy at this uh, log and in five minutes it was gone. Now in our country, uh, we use a large number of wood for cremating bodies. I think using the sun in a creative way and uh, cremating bodies is a very pure form of uh, uh, cremation rather than using wood, which is causing a huge deforestation problem along with many other needs. So I had the opportunity of working in CII in 96, 97. And that time I was pestering the banking industry to give loans for solar and various aspects of green building. And uh, it did not happen. So therefore yesterday, rather yesterday, I saw the Hindu newspaper. I've read this uh, ad, which said that they're giving loan not only for home, but they have added solar rooftop. So the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, working with policymakers is not easy. Uh, many times they are myopic, they don't look at intergenerational responsibility. But if you keep at it, things do happen better late than never. Uh, in 2005, uh, in addition to sustainable development, I was also looking after CSR. And CSR kind of bored me to death because like giving loose change for doing something, you know. I said, no, I don't want money. Yeah. I disrupted the system and I said, Ki, look, in our hotel business, what is our core competency? We make good food, we deliver good service, we focus on safety, security, hygiene, and diplomacy. So I said, these are the very skills required by the domestic health which work in our respective homes in a diluted form. They need not know what is red wine and white wine. So in order to uh, start the process. We did a small program for these domestic health and taught them how to uh, work professionally because most of them come from villages and they are shell-shocked when they enter your home and my home. And unfortunately, in our homes, they are not guided by most of us. 75% of us exploit this. And this figure has come from one of the news channels, which I was hearing some time back. We said we need to add to the domestic health. 
So we made a domestic help training program wherein we said that I'm not going to hurry how to train his domestic help. Here's the program. You or your wife read it, internalize it, and you train the people. So sometimes when the challenges are large, you have to bring about systemic changes. You cannot be plodding along in this particular area. And then we did something else. We got about 10 domestic help. And I was part of the interviewing process. And they're all over here, five on the left and five on the right, wearing that creamish sari. And they were put under our training manager in our uh, big hotel in Delhi. And after one week, I went to meet them. I could not recognize them because the kind of training imparted by our training manager on soft skills and how to talk and how to dress, etc., was a completely transformational experience for me itself. And then we organized the program along with the government of India and Delhi government and brought them into the forum. Now, why am I telling you the story in detail is that in our country, if we get our domestic help to be certified and given proper training, we have an opportunity to send them to countries like USA and uh, EU countries because there they have a growing population. And we have a demographic dividend, as you all know. And uh, this will be successful only if they have been certified and they know how to handle each gadget and how to handle people, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a small country south of India called Sri Lanka has done this very successfully. And their domestic health is in great demand in all over the West. And they uh, repatriate $1 billion per year. Can you imagine the opportunities we have if we can also send our people in large numbers? So that is the thought process of this particular training program. Uh, that has not happened still, but I'm very happy that in 2015, the government of India started a domestic workers sector skills council where they impart this kind of training to people. Then in 2021, uh, I developed a gold standard for how to deal with domestic health respectfully and with dignity. And I'm not asking anyone of you to increase their salary but to give them inputs which I have highlighted over here. And I'll focus on number three. Two years back, I did not know that uh, Pulsio existed for 12 rupees. But the moment I got to know about it, I kind of um, enrolled my driver and domestic health in this particular policy. And then we impart soft skill to them when they're working with us. And we ask them questions on fire safety, how do you reduce water consumption, energy efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there are so many opportunities of adding value to them. Like, you know, your family can give free tuition, spare time to the children, or uh, teaching them some handicrafts once a week or something so that you value add them. And so that next time when they get another job, they get a better uh, salary than what they're getting today. And most important, please give them one weekly holiday. Then on 10th of January, I came to know about Ishram. It's a program of the government of India uh, for the informal workers. And it covers your housemate, uh, sales girl, sales boy work in your shop and nearby shop, rickshaw pool, et cetera, et cetera. And they have a scheme of covering these people for rupees 2 lakhs without any payment at all. And uh, there's a uh, free treatment of five lakh for hospitals also now. Who's eligible? All persons who age is between 16 and 59, and who's not eligible? Those who are member of EPFO, ESI, et cetera. These are uh, very sketchy details, but if you visit the uh, site of Ishram, you'll get all the details. So if there are 140 or 150 students today, if you can start this today and report back to uh, the Prem Jain Memorial Trust, I think uh, Dr. Prem Jain, wherever he is, he'll be very happy that these 140 students have uh, taken this uh, great step. So the building that you see on the left is the ITT Green Center. I was involved in the project stages. In the project stages, I told my project manager that, look, uh, the guys who are making this building, we need to add value to them. He said, so what do you mean? I said, look, they're migrant laborers and uh, their wives either work for water or they are working for uh, wood. Uh, let us demonstrate to them what is a solar uh, uh, concentrated technology. And we also told them this is expensive, cost 5,000 rupees. It doesn't make sense for one person to buy it and use it. They could buy, you know, four or five families can join together and they can cook in this, uh, depending on a program that you set up 
uh, 300 days in the year. And this will help them to uh, not walk forward and decimate the forest. And uh, then this concept, people will say, no, but people don't like to cook together. Each woman likes to cook in the comfort of her home, etc. But then we said, look, if you go to Punjab, they have this tandoori, uh, tandoor in every home. But the tandoor is not lit every day individually by each family. So what they do is they have turns. So today, eight family, the tandoor will be on and four families will come there and make roti and go. It's called Sanja Chula. So we need to copy these uh, concepts and see how we can use it. Or if you don't want to use for cooking, you can use it for heating water. And that should not be a problem or boiling something. So these are the concepts that we need to uh, um, perhaps bring into play. But in addition to this, considering that we are talking in the backdrop of the COP26 meeting which got over in Glasgow, and India has committed to uh, installing uh, 500 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2030, we have to see how these concepts which I'm sharing with you is, how can we store the heat from this concentrator? And I recall my late friend, Jimmy in Indore, he bought these uh, couplers which are there between the two bogies, and he concentrated the heat on the couplers and closed it with a metallic casing and opened a small aperture on the top. And he loaded the heat in the daytime. In the evening, he would cook with this. So my submission to the young friends that are listening to this particular um, conversation can think of more innovative things. Then in 2005, we started an initiative for employing people with disabilities, as we saw in the video some time back. So when we started this initiative, we said there'll be no sympathy for people with disabilities. There'll be only empathy, because sympathy leads to shedding crocodile tears. And there's so much sympathy in this country. I think the crocodile tears can solve the uh, water problem that Hari conducts practically every fortnight. And here again, we said, OK, identify what's the disability and put him or her in the right job. So if you look at the bottom right side, it's a doorman. He's hearing and speech impaired. His job is to smile at you and open the door. He is even there today, and he joined us in 2005. Similarly, the guy on the left, he's also hearing and speech impaired, and he works in the reservations. So you must be wondering, how does he work in reservations? Well, in those days, uh, there were very few five-star hotels, and the girls in this particular hotel uh, were busy taking reservation, but they were not loading it on the computer. So the front office manager did not know whether to overbook or not. So when this guy came who was uh, computer literate, the girls would give him the reservation form and he'll load it. And by six o'clock, he'll tell the front office manager, okay, you can do minus 10 or don't take any more rooms. And thanks to this boy, the revenue of this hotel's uh, room revenue increased by 60 lakh. The point that I'm trying to make is that if we open the eyes in the eyes of our mind, there are lots of opportunities and there are lots of examples of this in uh, because of uh, paucity of time. I'm not going to go into details on that. But let me tell you about the laundry gentleman on the right. These two guys are blind guys. So I told my housekeeper, why don't you give them a job? So she was upset with me, but she said, well, how can they work here? I said, no, I'm not forcing you. You uh, interview them. If you like them, take them, otherwise forget it. So these two boys came for interview and she asked them, how will you come to the hotel? So these two boys said in their sing-song voice, Madam, when we can go from Bangalore to Delhi on our own, we can come to the hotel. So Madam was very floored with this answer. The interview was over. We got the help of National Association of Blind. We helped these guys to uh, understand how to enter the hotel, where's the staff locker room, where's the cafeteria, and how they'll have to work in laundry. So in laundry, we have a machine called the calendaring machine, which is like a Gandhika juice machine, but a larger version. So the bed sheets are put from uh, one side by two guys, and from the other side, they fold it. So we created a body system, two blind guys and two guys who can see. And it worked very beautifully. Uh, having done all this, we realized that we, when we started doing this, there were no books to refer to. So I wrote a book on how to employ people with disability. It's a very simple book, 12 pages, six pages picture, six pages write-up. And we shared our learning over there. And any industry can infer from it and apply to their industry. And then uh, giving jobs is not important. Along with that, you have to make sure that your infrastructure is barrier-free for them. 
So we wrote a book on this subject, how to uh, make uh, ramps, and what are the other features that you need to have. And keeping the Indian context in mind, we did not copy paste the uh, international standards, although the international standards are also there. But we also said it can be done in a very economical fashion by people if they open their eyes. So these books, if you're interested, are there in the public domain. Then I said, okay, we employ 300 people in a country of 7 million people. It's neither here or there. So I had a lot of friends in the IT industry. So I requested them to give free space to the hearing and speech impaired boy in HCL. And uh, space was free. And then I requested one of my sister divisions to give him free furniture. So he worked in tandem with one of his so-called abled uh, relative because uh, hearing and speech impaired people cannot do all aspects of business. For us, it's just doing business is not so easy for him, that much more difficult. So when HCL had installed this, after a few months, I went there to see how he was performing. And I saw the transaction going on between him and some staff over there. So I asked one of the girls over there, do you have any problem in interacting with this person? So her answer was, oh, he's such a handsome guy. Then she said, no, no, we have no problem. We have learned sign language from him. So what am I trying to tell you that by mainstreaming these, mainstreaming these people in the public domain, you created an internal churn and an external churn in the uh, social domain. And here again, I'm happy to say that in 2015, the government of India started a uh, skills council for uh, people with disabilities. And then this is another interesting story. When our building was ready, we, uh, we were using something like 2000 cups per day, each cup costing two rupees. So I said, the building should not be green. Our processor should be also green. So then I suggested to my bosses that, look, uh, let us get rid of these paper cups costing two rupees, a waste of money, and uh, replace it ceramic uh, um, cups. And uh, we'll engage uh, three hearing and speech impaired guys who will serve tea coffee and also wash it. So here's an example of triple bottom line. We save the pulp by not using paper cup. We address the social dimension by uh, uh, mainstreaming the hearing and speech impaired people. And we also focused on the economic uh, dimension that we reduced our uh, operating costs and they started earning money with dignity and respect. I recall Dr. Jain used to come to this building and I'm sure he must have experienced when he went to some people's office, they would call this hearing and speech impaired guy and tell him, uh, you want C, C is for coffee and T is for tea. So people used to wonder what is the sign language going on and then we tell the guests that this is what we're doing. And people were very impressed that a hotel chain uh, has mainstreamed it. Uh, then I used to interact a lot with the uh, NGOs who were in the disability space. I said, look, uh, you're doing a good job. Please keep at it. But we have to see why are children born with disabilities? So I had the opportunity of going to Koppal in 2016. I saw a lot of malnourishment there. So I told the concerned NGO there, look, why don't you start Bank of Nutrition? So he, he said, what do you mean? I said, look, why don't you kind of nurture moringa, papaya, guava, lime, amla, banana. And if uh, somebody's poor, give them five or six of these saplings, they'll nurture it and it'll grow. And when it grows, they'll have access to superfoods. And you know the importance of moringa, lime, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go into details of that. But that concept moved from one to another five villages and then there was a hard stop, nothing happened. Then in 20, 2021, I found a local partner in Bangalore who teaches poor kids in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. So I told him, Paritosh, you are taking care of the nutrition of the mind, but you're not taking care of the nutrition of the body. He said, what do you mean? I said, look, you are dealing with uh, underprivileged or uh, people with lesser resources than you and I have, and you need to kind of uh, give them experiential learning. So I told him, you know, you can buy these saplings and then tell the kids, to dig holes in their respective homes with the help of their mother, father, in-laws, outlaws, whoever may be there, and they'll take care of it. He rolled it out in 43 villages in 2020. And uh, then after a year, these pictures have come to me. It's so, so nice to see papaya, moringa, and other things growing. And this year, he's rolled it out in a total of uh, uh, 100 villages now. And now he's gone one step ahead. He said, I want to make a pond in every farmer's place. So I'm looking for somebody who will help me in giving them 
input on how to you know uh, make the pond so that siltation doesn't happen and everything happens properly and he's created competition between the village uh, village uh, different villages so that the survival rate of the uh, saplings is very high and i've told the survival rate is very good so at a young age you're not only teaching them abcd but you're giving them life skills and once the green cover increases then the impact of climate change will be reduced. And this will happen only when it happens in all the six flag villages of India, and also perhaps in Africa and other countries where there are similar challenges. You know, in our country, there are so many kinds of inequities. There is gender inequity, there is a digital inequity, there's a water inequity, right? You know it. And it's important for us to build resilience for the informal sector, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, it can be done through these small means. And look at the construction sector. They have dedicated workers coming from villages, living in their uh, colony. All they have to do is demonstrate these things, make a few posters in the language that they understand and share this knowledge. It doesn't cost money. Art ki mele in liye, but it doesn't happen. So I, show, I hope you enjoyed this uh, little uh, cartoon here. So triple bottom line, we learned by practice in Port Blair, but now from financial year 22-23 as per Securities Exchange Bureau of India, top thousand corporate sector have to follow the uh, business responsibility and sustainability reporting, and they'll have to do all this and much more. So the point that I'm trying to make is that each one of you has a great opportunity of doing much more in this uh, domain than what I have done. I call what I have done a nano drop, but you can also create your nano drops and then scale it up by networking with the right people. So oh, I love this quote of Roosevelt, test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it's whether you provide, provide enough for those who have too little. I want you to read it and internalize it. I hope you liked it. I hope you have internalized it. And uh, I must tell you that all the three dimensions of sustainable uh, triple bottom line are pregnant with opportunities, provided you become a little innovative and ask tough questions and don't be wrapped around your WhatsApp university and uh, take a, the WhatsApp university is taking away your mind space. Please keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Dhaniwad.